Portions of AquaKids have been produced with the cooperation of the National Estuarine Research Reserve System. So, ready to make a difference? Building a better planet starts with you. With record populations of fish species, Lake Erie boasts that it's the most productive of all of the Great Lakes. Right now, the Aqua Kids are about to do a very important trawl to determine the catch limit of each species. What we're gonna do now is one of our index trawls. We use these to assess uh, the population status of fish in Lake Erie. We've got a trawl up here on this wheel, a couple doors that are gonna pull that trawl open as we lower it into the water. We'll tow it for about 10 minutes, pull it up, and see what we catch. So what are we looking to find here? Well, we should find Lake Erie uh, perch and walleye. We'll also get some white bass, uh, some white perch, probably some catfish and freshwater drum, a real mixed bag around here. So why exactly do you do this trawl? We use the, these trawls, we do over 40 of them um, in the Ohio waters of Lake Erie, and we use them to assess uh, the recruitment of young fishes. So how many fish are going to move up into the population and be available for commercial fishers and anglers? So this is going along the bottom, right? How far down is it? We're only in seven meters of water, so it will be right on the bottom. How often do you guys go trawling? We go monthly, and we do, in our side of the lake, we do over 20 trawls in our portion every month from May through September. So where we are right now, is this kind of a nursery for the fish, or what's the importance of this site? We are in Sandusky Bay, and Sandusky Bay is shallow, warm, and productive, so it is a great nursery site. Oh. So this is a, lar a large Lake Erie walleye that we just caught in our trawl. This is what the anglers are out there targeting. All right. I want to let this guy go, though, so somebody can catch him. All okay. right, do it. This is a nice yellow perch. Yellow perch and walleye are the dominant fisheries in Lake Erie. What kind of carp is this? This actually looks like a goldfish. Oh, my bad. <laughs> yeah, yep. when, they, when, they're, when they're wild, they're not orange. <laughs> so after they've been released in the lake, sometimes they'll turn into their natural gold color. Really? So just wild goldfish, that's yep. what they call them. Yep. All right, so we've got freshwater drum. Uh -huh. Okay. This is a white perch. This is a non-native species in the lake. Uh, what are some other species? Other fish that we have are channel catfish. This walleye is about a year old. That's and, much smaller than the other ones. Yep. And last year we actually had our second highest uh, recruitment or, or year class of walleye come out since we started the trawl survey. Really? So next year the lake is going to be full of these fish. But they're going to be, be big, happy. Enough, big enough to keep. <laughs> so these are gizzard chad. These are excellent forage fish, okay? The walleye love to eat these. The oh. perch will even eat them when they're small. So this is a lot of what feeds this lake in terms of producing the large fish. Okay. Which type of perch is this? That's a yellow perch. Again, the, the native species that everyone likes to fish for. Again, can you tell us why this is important? This is what we do to uh, determine how many fish are produced each year, how many fish are born. Uh -huh. So this is our way of monitoring the health of the fish populations and to set our harvest limits. And what is the overall health of this lake? Uh, overall, the fish populations are doing great. Okay, cool. Andrew, that was so much fun. Yeah, trawling is awesome. Hey, guys. Hey. How was the trip? Amazing. <laughs> what did you learn? I learned the important role of surveys like this in the health of all of Lake Erie and the recreational fishing here. And I learned that Lake Erie is the most productive lake out of all the Great Lakes. Wow. Keep up with us as our Great Lake adventure continues. For more information on today's show, go to aquakidstv.org. Welcome back to Aqua Kids. As our Great Lakes adventure continues, we're here in Sandusky, Ohio, about to board a research vessel to go monitor fish populations with a mobile tracker. Hey, Lily, it's Matt and Jim. Hey, hey guys, how's it going? How's it going? How's it going? Oh. Good to see you. Good. Good to see you. 
So we're going to go out into Sandusky Bay here on Lake Erie and we're going to do some mobile tracking for some tagged walleye and then we're also going to retrieve one of the acoustic receivers that's out year-round listening for some of the tagged fish. Awesome, let's set sail. So we've arrived out here on Sandusky Bay and we're going to uh, use our mobile hydrophone here to uh, put it into the water and we're going to listen to see if there's any tagged walleye or lake sturgeon or any other fish that have been tagged that are in the area right here. So why do you tag these fish? So we're tagging fish throughout the Great Lakes to get a better understanding of where within the lake they're moving and then also where they're moving among the lakes. So just because a walleye is in Lake Erie, you could also swim up to Lake Huron and, and be caught by a fisherman up there just as easily as someone down here. Why is it so important that you do that? Uh, it helps us to better manage all of the fisheries um, on Lake Erie, but also if they're swimming into other lakes, the other states and provinces also need to be aware of that. And so in order to really listen for the fish, we're going to have to shut the boat engines down because it's loud, makes it easier for this to hear. And so we're going to put this over the side. We're going to lower this down. This sound is just the ambient noise uh, around the surrounding area. It could be the waves crashing. Uh, if there's a fish in the area, we'll hear some pings. Um, I'm not sure if there's any fish in the area, uh, but right now the fish or the, the receiver is in the water listening for any uh, a tag walleye, lake sturgeon, etc. Uh, that might be out in the water around us. All right, so we're going to try and retrieve one of the acoustic receivers that's out here in the lake year round listening for, their, for our tagged fish. So it's going to be just like listening for them. We'll put it over the side, lower that down. And we got to come into our uh, mobile receiver here. Okay. And instead of just listening, we've actually got to send a signal down to, to the equipment. What right. kind of signal is it? It's an acoustic signal. So it's going to operate on 69 kilohertz. It's going to go down. The piece of equipment is going to listen to it. And it's going to recognize that it needs to come to the surface when we punch in a code. We'll send that signal. And hopefully, you guys will be able to see it come to the surface here. OK, cool. That's fancy. So now the acoustic receiver is armed. It's going to be listening for the signal that I'm about to send to it now. And hopefully in a few seconds, you'll see it float to the surface. We're on the lookout for a receiver. Oh, Drew. All right, so what's next? So we're going to send a, a third signal down to the acoustic receiver. And then it's going to, 20 to 30 seconds later, pop to the surface. And we'll scoop it up with a net. Star she blows. All right, here we go. We got it. My childhood lacrosse days have prepared me for this. Oh, got it. There we are. So this is the acoustic receiver that we were just talking to. We have the floats on it so that it will come to the surface. Mm -hmm. And this is the part that's actually listening for the fish out in the lake. So, so are these floats filled with ballast and they fill up when nope, you- Nope, it's just, you... just filled with air. Oh, cool. Uh, pops to the surface. How does it rise on command? Uh, so what you didn't see down here, it's got a little uh, a, a piece that attaches to the anchors on the bottom. That slowly unscrews when we send those signals down. Oh, I got you. And as that unscrews, this then goes up to the surface and into your net. Neat. So Matt, the big question is, how important is this to the Great Lakes? This is hugely important. Up until uh, five to ten years ago, we were not able to examine fish movement on the scale that we are. And uh, by working together with all the states and other provinces, uh, together under the Great Lakes Acoustic Telemetry Observation System, we're able to basically listen to fish movement throughout Lake Erie, and it helps uh, fisheries biologists like myself know when and where walleye and lake sturgeon and other fish are moving throughout the year that previously we were not able to understand. Matt, thank you so much for having us out here. Yeah. You guys are doing a lot of great work, and it's really important for the lake. We'll be right back. Want to keep up with our adventures? Follow us on Twitter and Facebook. Welcome back to Aqua Kids. Old Woman Creek is home to a huge diversity of fish species. Today, Selena and Andrew will be electroshocking to get a look at the biodiversity here. They may even get to puke a fish, which would mean they get an in-depth look at what the food chain looks like. So Christy, I've been fishing before, but never with this kind of setup. What are we doing today? So today we're going to use a pretty common method used in fisheries sciences and that's called electrofishing where 
we put an electrical current into the water that stuns the fish and just temporarily. While they're stunned, you're gonna scoop them up with these nets and put them into this live well here where, where they will recover. Why are we doing it? We're gonna be looking at the populations of fish that we have in here. So diversity, how many different species we have. We can look at how big the different fish are, look at their size, their weight. Um, and then one project that an undergraduate intern is doing this summer for us is he's looking at what the predators are eating. He's looking at whether they're eating native fish or non-native prey fish. So we're gonna puke some stomachs, we're gonna puke some fish, look at what they ate and see if they prefer native versus non-native prey. Puking the fish? How are we gonna do that? We're just gonna take um, some water that's in a pesticide type applicator container and we have some small tubes attached to that. We'll put the tube down the um, fish's throat and squirt water into it and just flush, flush out their contents with water. Sounds really fun. When they recover, we'll let them go. Well, I'm really excited. Can we get started? Yep, here's your net. All right, thank you. We'll close the gate. You guys can stand up front and we'll get going. Okay. And we're off. <laughs> okay, Kelly, why don't you show them how to lower the um, droppers into the water and then we'll be ready to go. All right, so we're gonna take these chains off and lower this down just so it's above perpendicular from the water. Just so it's about even with this one. There? Yep. Okay, once I turn the generator on, we'll be ready to go. I told you already, those pedals in front are what you both need to be standing on in order for the electrical current to be complete. Look back at me when you're both ready. I'll give you the thumbs up and then you can step on the pedals and start netting fish. Okay. <laughs> What kind of catfish is that? This is called a brown bullhead. You can see it's got brown whiskers. You can also tell because its pectoral spine has some ridges along the back of it. So that lets you know it's a brown bullhead instead of a yellow or a black bullhead. Okay. All right, these are also native to the Great Lakes, although they've been stocked in a lot of reservoirs where they're not native. It's called a gizzard shad. It's uh, in the same family as alewife. You can see it's got a really long, final dorsal fin filament at the base to let you know that it's a gizzard shad. And I'll let you feel this. Rub your finger that way. What does that feel like? It feels very rough. Yep, it's got a really sharp keel to it. All right, now I'm pretty sure I caught a very large goldfish while I was out there. Is that right? Yep, this is a goldfish. Um, it is in the minnow family, but obviously it's not little. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> You can tell the difference between it and a common carp by whether it has barbels or little whiskers coming off of the front of its mouth, so you don't see any whiskers there. So you can see that um, anyone that decides they don't want their goldfish anymore and wants to throw them out in a local pond or lake, they do survive, they do start reproducing on their own. These are not native. They're considered naturalized because they are um, a self-sustaining population out here now. So this here is an emerald shiner. This is a very important prey fish for the Great Lakes. It's a native species. It's also a minnow, um, a cyprinid. And so these are really important for a lot of the different um, predatory fishes that we rely on economically and recreationally for fishing. Based on the diversity of fish that we have in here, does that say anything about the health of the lake? Um, we do have a lower diversity right now with what we caught than what we might catch um, some other times. But a lot, a lot of the fish that we've caught today are indicative of um, 
more eutrophic system, so a system that does receive more nutrient loading to it, and that is characteristic of this estuary. So these are a lot of species that are more tolerant. We need to puke someone now. All right, we can try this white bass here. Oh, wow. All right, I'm going to need one of you to help hold the fish or to help um, spray the water out. All right. You Go can ahead. squeeze, yep. How's that? Look at that, we got some fish coming out. Uh, Squeeze again. Perfect. So what do you think we have? Looks like we have some different uh, minnows most likely. They're pretty well digested, so it's gonna be a little hard to identify them. Um, one way that when they are this far digested that you can identify them is with their pectoral bone called the clythra. So what my undergrad intern will be doing is when we get something like this out of the stomach, He'll actually dissect out the, basically the pectoral girdle, the shoulder, um, and try to identify what kind of fish it is. Wow. Thank you so much. I've had a lot of fun. Thanks for coming along. <laughs> it was really cool learning how to puke a fish. You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> Aqua Kids will be right back. The gray wolf, ancestor to our modern dog, is found scattered throughout North America, Europe, Asia, and the Middle East. Once numbering in the millions, its population has fallen below 250,000 worldwide. An intelligent pack hunter, the wolf has a complex social structure and strong family bonds similar to humans. The ancient people learned to hunt by watching wolves. These carnivores keep herbivore species healthy by preying only on the weak and injured, preventing overpopulation and overgrazing. Habitat loss, conflicts with humans over livestock, and our fears are the greatest threats to this misunderstood creature. Find out ways you can help the gray wolf and other apex predators on our website. Welcome back to Aqua Kids. While the use of computers for measuring water quality is both accurate and easy, nothing is more important than taking a look at the indicator species of an ecosystem. Right now, we're at Old Woman Creek, where we're going to be taking a look at the macroinvertebrates to see if this stream is in good health. So we're here at my favorite stream ever, which is Old hey, Woman Bree. Creek. Hey, how's it going? Great. So we're here today to do some macroinvertebrate sampling, and what it's going to do is help us to assess the condition of the stream. Well, the creek looks pretty dry. Is that okay? Yeah, so the stream is actually very dry right now because um, we actually are under the amount of rainfall that we get for the summer, and this is actually the driest I think I've ever seen the stream. So. Wow. Well, the water's not moving at all. Is that okay for the health of the stream? Well, you know, uh, flowing water is always the best um, for a lot of the aquatic life. However, these little pools that develop are still very, very vital to all of our aquatic life. So, Bree, what's a macroinvertebrate? Well, I'm glad you asked. So a macroinvertebrate is basically um, an invertebrate, which means it doesn't have a backbone, mm -hmm. and then macro, meaning that you can see it with the naked eye. And what we're gonna be looking for is called aquatic macroinvertebrates. So they're the types of organisms that need water to carry out all or at least part of their life cycle. So what kind of macroinvertebrates will we find today? Well, hopefully today we're gonna to find some that'll tell us that the stream is actually in good health. So macroinvertebrates are great because they range from being very pollution tolerant to very pollution sensitive. And the more pollution sensitive uh, macroinvertebrates that we find, it means that the water quality is, is much cleaner. So let's go collect some bugs. Come on, Lily. They're macroinvertebrates. Yeah, what he said. <laughs> okay, so now I want you guys to go ahead and get in the stream. And as soon as you guys get in there, I want you guys to do the best shimmy dance that you can do. Really dig your feet straight down into all those rocks and turn them up. And kick that water towards the net to try to help push that water towards. All right, now I want you guys to grab the either, either side of the net and slowly bring it up and make sure that water doesn't go over the top. Very good, very good. All right. There we go. Nice pull, guys. So there we've got a really nice dragonfly nymph. Wow. It's a good predator and a sign of good water quality. How long do they stay in this stage before they are able to fly? So it depends on species, but generally speaking, most of them spend about a year. Oh, wow. So this right here is called a water penny, and it is actually a beetle larva itself. Wow. I kind of like them because they're almost like our little freshwater horseshoe crabs that we <laughs> <Yeah>. have. <laughs> 
And this is also another sign of excellent water quality. So these guys are not very tolerant of pollution. So it tells you that the water quality must be pretty good for them to be here. That's great. So Bree, what does this all mean for the stream and its health? Well, I think that the fact that we found some pretty sensitive uh, species here, you know, like our water pennies and our dragonfly nymphs, I'd say that the stream is actually in pretty decent health. Well, Bree, that is great news for not only the health of the stream, but also the health of the ecosystem as well. Yes, you're right. That just about wraps it up for today's episode of Aqua Kids. It sure is amazing to see the work being done by the Old Woman Creek Research Reserve and their Ohio partners to help keep this planet green and blue. We'll see you next week on Aqua Kids as our Great Lakes adventure continues. I was so excited to welcome Aqua Kids to Old Woman Creek and Lake Erie. I love sharing the Great Lakes with the rest of the country. Aqua Kids.